and hit our Perfect, thank you so much. All right, good evening, everyone. So excited to see you virtually. I know that last meeting we got to meet in person and not able to do that today, but we're really excited to have HBA this morning, this evening, sorry, and have our speaker join us to talk about bees and bees and plants. Um, as usual, just a couple of introductions and quick announcements as we get started. We have a t-shirt sale going on right now. And I don't know how many of you have bought our HBA t-shirts, but they are back on sale again for our new bonfire campaign. Um, a small portion of each sale goes to the club. So please go on and get your t-shirts. I know I love mine. I wear them all the time. There's all different kinds. And if you go to that link at bonfire.com and forward slash HBA shirts, um, you'll be able to see all the different versions of shirts. They come in all sizes, men, women, kiddos, everything that you can think of. And it will be delivered directly to you, which is a bonus. It makes it easy on all of us. But please go in and get your t-shirts. We have 19 days to fulfill our order. On the Facebook site, Kyle has put a link so you can easily go to the t-shirts and order as many as you would like to. They're great to use when you're beekeeping, um, but they're also great just to uh, enjoy the summer with. Nice cotton blend and, and short sleeves. They're really nice, they wear them all the time. So please take the opportunity to go ahead and get your t-shirts. Um, as you know, we only offer this at certain times in the year. And so we're really excited to share that for this summer. All right. So today we're really excited. We have Lauren Simpson here. And I don't know how many of you may realize, but if any of you have followed the St. Julian's Crossing Wildlife Habitat on Facebook, she is the owner and wildscaper here in Houston in an oak forest that does all the pictures. She has a lovely, and I mean lovely garden um, in Oak Forest that I personally follow your pictures all the time. Pictures of bees and plants. I'm like, I want that yard. <laughs> it's beautiful. And so today she's with us to really talk about bees and the plants that they love. And so we're really excited to share this, mo this time with her. And of course, as usual, after um, she speaks, we'll have some Q&A and then have our door prizes at the end. So with that, Lauren, I'm going to turn it over to you. Great. Um, it says, I can't share while someone else is sharing. So I'm going to let you, you stop go. sharing. There we go. Okay. Just sound. All right. Can y'all see my screen? We can. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for that. That really kind welcome, Sandy. And mm -hmm. like Sandy said, I um, maintain a Facebook educational community called St. Julian's Crossing Wildlife Habitat. We're also on Instagram, Pinterest, where I'm not too active, and a face and a website, which is just a portal to the Facebook. Let's be honest. Um, but I, I was really excited when Joe reached out to me. I want to thank Joe Powers for the invitation. I really want to thank the um, Houston Beekeepers Association for letting me come to talk to you a little bit about native bees and the native plants that honeybees and native bees love. And so our gardens can be both supporting those bees and honeybees simultaneously, so I appreciate it. And I have some special thanks for Julie Dablang, whose last name I'm probably mispronouncing, but she is one of my mentors, I adore her. And she really helped me understand what it is that honeybees need. She's one of your members. And so she helped me with the selection of some of the trees for this presentation. Um, as, uh, uh, as you heard a minute ago, as Sandy was saying, the photographs that you're going to see in this presentation, like those on my Facebook community, are ones that I take in my home uh, wildlife habitat gardens here in Oak Forest in Houston. And so my house is under 1,600 square feet, and the front and backyards are comparable in size. They're proportional. They're not big. And what you're seeing here is the front yard. It's about 60% turned out into wildlife habitat. And as of last year, we're about 90% species of plant that are native to this eco region of Texas. And when I started increasing the number of native plants in the garden, the biodiversity in the gardens exploded. So all the photos that don't have an attribution in them that come from somewhere else, all the unattributed uh, ones come from my gardens. 
And so what you're seeing here is what I've actually documented there. And the good news, the rejoice and be glad moment is you can have this in your own garden too, with some pretty easy tips and tricks that we'll talk about later. Okay, so what I thought would be kind of fun would be to um, talk a little bit about how native bees differ from honeybees. Rather than walking you through different families of bees, I thought this might be the most helpful thing to do. So uh, let's talk about those and we'll kind of walk through it in parts. So the first thing is that native bees are really, really diverse physically. So um, colors, so they range from, if you look at the upper right, that's one of our native bees. It's a serotina or a small carpenter bee. So this one is a vibrant jewel green. Same for this one, this is a sweat bee, it's a female. Look at this one, iridescent blue and green. So they range from the blues and the greens all the way of course to yellow, black, but also brown red, all kinds of different colors. So they are just gorgeous. Oh, and I just realized that there are some questions in the chat, y'all. Um, when we get to the end, if someone in the group can vocalize those questions at the end, then it'll be preserved for the recording. So um, they have come in all different colors and they also come in all different sizes. So this is a participatory class. And in the words of Tom Lair, those who don't participate get to stay after class to clean the erasers. And if you're old enough to get that joke, welcome to my world. Okay, so I want you to take your pinky finger and I want you to hold up your pinky finger in front of your face. And I want you to look at the flesh colored part of your pinky finger. So that flesh colored part is approximately the size of this flower in the center of the screen. So this is Texas frog fruit, Phyllonota flora. It has a single head with a bunch of little florets around it. This bee is smaller than the flesh colored part of your fingernail. This is a lazy oat blossom. It's um, one of our sweat bees. And it's actually not the smallest native bee in North America. That's uh, an honor given to what we call fairy bees. Perdita is the genus, which is an adorable name, by the way. Common names for bees are super cute. So this gal is super, super tiny. And to the eye, some of these bees actually look like gnats. That's how tiny they are. I know how to distinguish them now only because I've been doing this six years and I know how they move and they move differently from how little gnats and flies and stuff move. So that's on one end of the scale. Now, hold up your thumb and I want you to look at the distance between the last knuckle and the tip of your thumb. So that's about the size of some of our biggest bees here in North America. That's carpenter bees like this one on the left here that's an eastern carpenter bee and this little one look at those racing stripes am i right is that like freaking cute by the way is it wrong that i want to cuddle bees just asking because i kind of do um and so our bumblebees and our carpenter bees tend to be bigger although some of our carpenter bees and bubbles can be a little bit smaller so they range greatly in size and they're also numerous. The different species are quite numerous. So in North America, the numbers are like around 4,000 species of bee that are native to North America. And according to Dr. Jack Neff, who I think is at UT, it's about 1,100 in Texas, because Texas, right? Okay, bigger and better. That's a lot of different bee species. And as you know, because you are um, honeybee keepers, the honeybee is not one of those. It's a domesticated insect that was brought over from Europe or other parts of the world. So they are physically very, very diverse. I will tell you that a few years ago, as I document the different species of insect in our gardens, I stopped counting at around 30 species of bee in our little gardens. I mean, that's a ballpark. And I'm sure it's much higher now. So the other thing about native bees is that they have very different social habits from those of honeybees and they nest in very, very different ways. So let's talk about those social habits. So as you know, with European honeybees, they are what we call truly social or eusocial. And what that means is they have, a high, they have a communal nest, mothers meet their daughters. There are specified roles within the nest. The queen bee looks different. The queen bee doesn't forage, right? Um, and they actually are so highly uh, developed that they have a rudimentary uh, you know, way of conveying information. Um, so they are truly social or eusocial. The thing is that our native bees, only a very few are social and they're not quite that high a level. So let's talk about the different ways that they are social, right? So the first is that we have solitary nesters. So, oh, and by the way, at the end of this, we're doing a little quiz. 
oh snap. So listen carefully. So most of our native bees are what we call solitary nest nesters. As a friend of mine says, you can think of those as single moms. That means one female bee makes usually what's a, a tunnel or a tube or a chamber, and she'll do egg, pollen, little, little loaf of pollen, and seal it up. And in a linear way, one in front of the other, all the way to the entrance, she'll line up those, um, those little modules with her, uh, with her eggs and the pollen in it. You can think of solitary bees as um, folks who live in uh, freestanding houses in the country, they're not in a neighborhood, right? So that's the majority of our native bees. Some of them are what we call aggregate nesters. So they're still single mamas and they still have one bee, one nest with her little chambers in it, but they like to group together. And so this is like um, the bees live in houses in a subdivision. So there are neighbors around them, but each one has their own house. Then there are what we call a communal nesters. So here, this is like a high rise apartment complex. Each of the females, Single mama still has one chamber, you know, one tube, one nest for one female, but they share a common entrance, just like at a high rise apartment in Manhattan, for example. Then there are what we call semi-social nesters, where they, I have to look at my notes on this because I don't, I, I haven't seen any in my garden like this, but they share the same nest and they together provide for the baby, so the larvae in it, and they do divvy up the work, but the colonies last for only one generation and the mamas don't need their daughters. So that's semi-social. And finally, are truly social. So a very small number of our native bees are like honeybees. Very small number are truly social. So this includes bumblebees, and this includes some of our sweat bees. And even then, they are very different in the way they carry it out. So they don't have communication forms um, like honeybees do. The, um, the queen bee actually goes out and forages. She actually hibernates or it's called diapause for insects over winter. She'll go out, she'll forage, get stuff in her little pollen baskets, come back, set up, and she's already mated in the prior year. And so she lays her eggs and then she gets female and other workers who start helping her. So very few of our native bees are social nesters. The other thing about them is that they nest in very different ways. So about 70% of our native bees nest underground. And what you see on the right-hand side in column three are two examples from my own gardens. This is a little sweat bee, a furrow bee, and I don't really know what this is, but the vast majority of our native bees, um, the females will dig a tunnel and then they'll lay their eggs within that and then close it off and that's it. Mama never needs daughters. Same for our native wasp, by the way. About 30% nest above ground, and they do it in a lot of different ways. So some of our teeny little bees, look at this, like that little, um, that jade, that gorgeous emerald green gal I showed you earlier. So they are so tiny that they use pithy or hollow stems of plants, and they chew into it with their little mandibles, dig out the stuff in there, and put their nesting chambers within it and then cap it off again. Again, mother doesn't need daughter. So one of the things that I tell folks if they have a wildlife habitat garden is, after a deep freeze, the first thing we wanna do is cut back all those dead stems because they just look awful, right? And I cordially invite you not to do that because you might be cutting off and composting egg larvae or bee larvae, so baby bees. And so they will actually also overwinter and shelter in there to get away from the cold. Some of the larger bees, larger than those teeny ones, will nest either in um, crevices above ground or uh, there's one carpenter bee species on my property that nests in bamboo. Um, others like other carpenter bees, some of the larger ones will chew into uh, wood. If you're having issues with that on your awning or your pergola, then put an old snag or dead stump out and they will go to the softer wood and they will nest in there. My husband made this little contraption here, which we ended up not keeping it. It wasn't done properly, it's early on, but he drilled holes in it so that a variety of our native bees could nest. And if you look, you can see that one of our leaf cutter bee mamas was in there. And so leaf cutter bees, I'm gonna show you a little video are super, super cool. Like the name implies, the mamas will cut 
a little semicircle out of a leaf and they go back to their little tube, whether it's in a, a stem or a crevice or whatever, and they line like wallpaper. They line the walls of the freaking nest with the leaf. And that helps keep out mold and mildew and moisture. Isn't that ridiculously cool? And so if you look in your garden, rose petals are a particular favorite, anything that's a little bit firmer. Um, if you see a semicircle, that's a mama bee. So let me show you what that looks like. Can you see it? Think how heavy that is for that little gal and watch what she does at the end. She's gonna fly away with that. Like that is gotta be as heavy as her whole body. So it's really, really cool. And those aren't some of the coolest nesters. Just a couple of fun examples. There's something called a cellophane bee or a bee or polyester bee. And so this one creates little nests in the ground. They're aggregate nesters in the ground. And it looks like little ant mounds or volcanoes above it. If you see that, you might have bees and not ants. And within it, they line the nest walls with a plastic-like material from an abdominal gland. They regurgitate it and they spread it around to keep moisture and fungus and the rest off it. And then they use a separate gland and expel things from their mandibles. It's a fungicide and a bactericide which is freaking cool. How did that, how is that a thing, right? Additionally, there are things called resin bees that they nest above ground. They cobble together little nests on twigs and stems um, that are like with little bits of debris and pebbles, resin from plants. Really, really cool. So anyway, that's just to give you a glimpse in the different ways that they nest. Very different from our honeybees. Um, I was saying before that it's like single mamas most of the time for our, our native bees when they nest. Well, the male bees for most of the, I think, I, I hesitate to say all, I'm a lawyer and I never say all, things are shades of gray, but, um, and I know life is what life is. But for most of them, especially the solitary bees, the males take no part in the nesting. They don't make the nest, they don't provision the nest, they don't cap it off, nothing like that. So when the female is building her nest, she'll sleep in it when she starts it until she caps it off, generally speaking. And if you see a female out and about sleeping outdoors, then it's because she hasn't started a nest or she's finished one. The thing is that, oops, we got some scribbles going on. I'm not sure what happened there. Huh. Um, the thing is, huh. The thing is that the males have nowhere to sleep because they generally speaking don't sleep in the nest. So what they do is they use their feet or their mandibles and they sleep on flowers, under flowers, on leaves and on stems. And some of them aggregate at night in what I like to call scientifically a boy bee slumber party. So what you see here are examples of those bees sleeping. And if we look at the video on the bottom right, you can actually see them settling down for the night. So the guys on the right here, they're clasping with their legs and mandibles onto a leaf. And this one here is clasping with the mandibles and just hanging sideways on a little, little stem. And you notice how they preen and they'll actually vie for position because guy bees. Uh, I don't know how that mark came up there, but we'll just keep going. Okay. The other thing about them is that, you know, we all know that adult bees primarily eat nectar and then they get a little pollen in it. And um, baby bees primarily eat pollen, but there's a little nectar mixed in that too. So babies eat pollen because pollen is, has a lot of protein in it. Okay. The thing is that honeybees are what we call generalists. And that means that honeybees, um, they can pretty much, the larvae can feed on any kind of pollen around. They're not particular. But that's not true for about 25% of the native bee species in the eastern part of the U.S. And in central and western U.S., it's 30 and 35% respectively. These bees are what we call specialists. So a specialist is a bee whose larvae feeds on the pollen of only those plants in a single family, genus, or species. 
Some of them are species specific. So if we don't have those native plants that they have evolved with and evolved to consume in the larval phase, those specialists are in trouble. Maybe they can eat stuff from a genus of plant, pollen from a genus of plant that's not native, but maybe not, and certainly not those ones that can feed only on, um, on those, uh, that one plant's pollen. They also collect their pollen very, very differently. So on the bottom left, this is what you're familiar with, right? This is pollen basket or curbicula, curbicula is plural. So our bumblebees, I think, are the only native bees that have a pollen basket, like honeybees do. And they, they use it the same way, right? It's shaped similarly. They pack in the pollen from their bodies. They use nectar or saliva to, to make it stick and all of that. But that's not how the majority of our native bees carry pollen. Instead, they use what we call a pollen broom. So a pollen broom, or scopa, um, are specialized hairs. They're usually bracted, and sometimes they have this like um, sort of static electricity way of holding onto pollen. Other ways, it's just that they're bracted and it just really clings to it. So you can think of them as dust mops. A lot of them, the females have these, and the males don't have it. Remember, they don't provision the nest. They don't take part in the nesting. So they have what uh, I like to call pollen pants, or my friend says Cheetos anybody, right? <laughs> so they carry them on their hind legs. There are some native bees though that carry it on their tummy, on their ventral abdomen. So this is a little yellow bee butt here. And if you see that, that's going to be a leaf cutter bee female for sure. So anytime you see these pollen brooms, that for sure is a female bee. And what I'm gonna show you in the bottom right is a phenomenon called buzz pollination. So for certain plants, and this is especially some of our crop plants, so things in the potato family, like tomatoes, potatoes, eggplant, chili peppers, and so forth. The anthers are, are um, formed in such a way that the pollen is not accessible unless it's vibrated back and forth pretty violently. And so some of our native bees, not the honeybee, but some of our native bees have evolved to buzz, they get in the flower and they, they move their, their wings and very, very rapidly. And it makes a really, um, it makes a noise that I'll share with you in a second. And they knock that pollen out of the anthers. And so they're very, very important for some of our key crops. So this is a female carpenter bee doing that in a partridge pea flower. Listen. Isn't that cool? So they practice buzz pollination. And finally, there are some bees that don't look like bees at all. These kind of look like wasps, don't they? They lack hair. And the reason they lack hair is because the females don't collect pollen and don't even make a nest. Let me say that again. They don't make their own nest. We call them cuckoo bees because they're kleptoparasites. And that means like the cuckoo bird, that the females find the nest of another type of bee. They've evolved to be parasites on particular types of bees, right? Some of them are um, longhorn bees. Some of them are parasites on, you know, those leaf cutter bees. And they will wait till the mama's away. They'll lay their egg into a chamber with the egg of the host and their egg will hatch first and they will either kill or eat the um, host egg or just eat up all the pollen. And so these are very, very clever gals. And because the females don't nest, they don't have a nest to sleep in. And so you'll see males and females of all of these cuckoo bees sleeping outside. Super, super cool. All right, class is in session. Y'all ready? We're gonna use the chat function. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take us out of the um, view mode. All right. So I'm gonna have three slides with true false questions. And I want you to use the chat function. And in the chat function here, let me get my, let me see if I can find it. Oops, for some reason, it's not showing me my options here. That's okay, someone tell me what, uh, well, that's all right. So T for true and F for false, you ready? No grades, I'm not that mean. All native bee species lay their eggs in their own nest. True or false? There we go, there's chat. Agreed, false, well done. Cuckoo bees do not make their own nest, just like a cuckoo bird. All right, 
You're doing uh, one for one, y'all. Most native bees nest below ground. True or false? Yes. Keep going. True. Very true. About 70% nest below ground and about 30% nest above ground. Well done. Here we go. Next. Come on. Oops. Most native bees are social nesters, just like honeybees. True or false? Yep, you got that. That's right. Most of them are solitary and they are not. They are not uh, uh, social nesters. Well done. Okay. A plus for everyone. Woo! Well done, class. Okay, so let's talk a minute about why I'm gonna go a little bit further afield than just bees. So the question here is what we're gonna talk about in the next few slides. So why should we help all insects, including bees? So why am I going broader? So the reason I'm going more broadly here is um, there are actually three reasons. The first reason is that bees are not the only pollinators, of course. Um, over the time that I've been doing this, of course, everyone knows that moths and butterflies and bees are pollinators, but actually a much wider range of animals are. So basically a pollinator is any animal that takes the pollen when it's foraging for nectar or pollen and transports it from the male component in the anthers to the female component of that flower or another flower, either, either pollination of that plant or cross-pollination. So it can be any animal that's enjoying the nectar or pollen reward of that flower. This includes flies, huge pollinators, wasps. The adults of most wasp species feed on nectar and some pollen. Um, they sometimes will drink the equivalent of blood from insects, the hemolyph, but primarily they're nectar and pollen feeders and they paralyze your garden pest and caterpillars and put them in their nest for their babies, which are meat eaters. They are predaceous, so, so wasps are double bang for the buck. And I am one with them. things like beetles, bugs, birds like hummingbirds, bats. So all kinds of different things can pollinate. And that's one of the reasons we're talking about insects generally. Beyond pollination, insects provide more eco services than just pollination. And we're going to talk about some of those things in a minute. And finally, third, if the ecosystem that our honeybees and native bees needs fails, then our bees fail. You can think of it as a rising tide lifts all boats. So why would I want to plant a plant that will feed only my honeybees and a few of the, some of, um, give some pollen and some nectar to some insects, but not feed the butterfly caterpillars and not feed the moth caterpillars that my mama birds rely on. So, why not use equivalent plants that are native, that our native species of insects can use and thereby save them, save the ecosystem and save our bees. So it's kind of a win-win situation. So we're gonna talk about that rising tide lifting all boats now. So this is a really cool study y'all. It came out in 2006, so 15 years, wow. Um, it was trying to estimate the dollar value per year in the continental United States of native insect eco services, not honeybees, because there's a lot of data on honeybees. And so they wanted to look uniquely at not just native bees, but all native insects in the United States. They said at the beginning that our number is way low, way low. And already they were estimating it at $60 billion a year way beyond pollination. So let's take a look and see what those things are. And some of these things apply to honeybees and others do not. So this applies to honeybees as well as our native bees and any pollinators. So they provide tremendous crop pollination services. So about two thirds of our crops and therefore about a third of what's on our plate each day requires pollination to fruit or to grow up, have a nut or a berry or whatever. This equates to billions of dollars a year from our native insect friends. Add on top of that, honeybees, which are a huge crop pollinate, uh, pollinator. Um, and rightly so, because they practice flower constancy, which means they like to pollinate a lot of the same flowers. They forage in the same flowers before they move on. That's one of the reasons honeybees are such effective pollinators. Some of our natives do that too. 
So first off, they provide pollination services for crops, but beyond that, and this includes honeybees too, they provide other pollination services. So about, depending on the metric you look at, about 75 to 95% of our flowering plants require some kind of animal pollination, not necessarily insect, we're going broader than insect here, in order to um, propagate. So, uh, you know, they're not wind pollinated, they're not, you know, like auto pollinated or whatever other forms might exist. Um, so this about the vast majority of our flowering plants. And of course, um, if we don't have pollination services primarily from insects, but also from a few other animals, then we lose plants. And if we lose plants, we lose erosion prevention, flood control, which we desperately need in Houston, both of those, and carbon sequestration. Um, most, some plants sequester carbon in the trunk, like trees, and they're very good at it. Others sequester it in the root, like our native, we're, we're coastal prairie, y'all. So our coastal grasses and our coastal forbs or flowering plants, they sequester that carbon in the root. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Beyond pollination services, insects are a huge part and a fundamental, like low level part of the food chain that so many other animals above them need to survive. So on the one level, um, of course, if you don't have pollinators pollinating the plants that will feed future pollinators, you're in trouble. But likewise, a little chipmunk or whatever he is on the bottom right, uh, he's eating some kind of fruit. And so um, if 75 to 95% of our flowering plants require pollination to propagate, and that includes those that produce fruits, berries, not, uh, and things like that, then we're in trouble if we don't have uh, insects to pollinate, right? And therefore all the critters that rely on those things, mammals and other humans and other mammals, uh, birds and so forth are in trouble. But beyond pollination, insects are just a really great part of the diet. So they have a good level of protein. Um, they're, they pack it in. They take energy from the first trophic level that gets it from the sun, the plants, and they convert it into something that can be eaten. And so they're, they're a, a big part of what critters above them eat. So you see our, our little anole there with some kind of bug in its mouth, and then you see the mama bird. So let's talk for a minute about birds to see how important this is. So um, about a quarter of our, and this is from Bringing Nature Home, Dr. Doug Tallamy, and various of the studies that, um, that he's participated in and others, and that he cites in those books. And I'll, I'll show you those books in a minute. So about a quarter of adult birds' diets consist of insects. So they're either, it's usually a supplement to other things that they eat because many, not always, but many species can eat things like berries and grains and things like that. That is not true of their chicks. 96% of our terrestrial birds, their chicks cannot digest anything but insects. They can't. They can't eat berries, they can't eat nuts, they can't eat grains, can't eat fruit. They have to have insects. And so Dr. Tallamy talks about a study in um, those two books there, and I've seen it uh, now, I've seen it in other studies as well, where they're like, well, then how many does a mama bird need to feed a clutch of babies? And the answer is a boatload, <laughs> a lot. So there was a study done um, with um, Carolina chickadees I think it may have been in the Northeast. Dr. Tallamy cites it or else he participated in it. I can't remember at this point in time, mind like a steel colander. But in any event, he talks about that study. And they ascertained that a single mama chickadee for a single clutch in a single nest needs not dozens, not hundreds, but thousands of insects, thousands to feed one clutch of babies. Some of the numbers I've seen, depending on the species, the number of chicks, 2,000 to 9,000, I mean, it's a lot. Don't quote me on that, but it's thousands, y'all. So if we don't have the right plants that these insects can feed on and we don't invite them into our gardens, baby birds starve. And what some of, Tallamy talks about some researchers finding like dead chicks either smaller broods, like smaller numbers of chicks, smaller, fewer eggs being laid, or the chicks starve to death and in desperation, the mom is bringing like brains and nuts desperately trying to feed them. Now that's like the saddest thing I've ever heard. 
So we need insects to feed other animals. They also provide us really good decomposition services, right? So, and this is not honeybees. So they can recycle dung, certain of them. They can break down dead plant matter. They can break down carrion. Um, they also, when they die and they dissolve back into the ground and they degrade, they release um, stuff that's really good for the soil. And I have no idea if it's because of the thousands of insects in my garden or not, but I don't use fertilizer anymore. I just don't. The soil is really, really rich, and it's probably a combination of the nitrogen-fixing plants that I have and a lot of dead bugs. They release nitrogen and a lot of great stuff. So they also provide really good pest control, certain of them. Again, not honeybees or our bees in general. About four and a half billion dollars annually. So these are things like um, assassin bugs and ambush bugs and certain of the flies are. And uh, so, uh, you know, we talked about flies being pollinators. There's a family of fly flies called hoverflies or flower flies. And not all of them, but some of them have larvae that are predaceous. And so the adults are pollinators and the larvae of those species can consume, depending on the species, between two to 400 aphids before they pupate. So like, I want that in my garden, right? <laughs> right? So they're important for pest control. The problem is, and, and bees and monarchs get a lot of press for this, but it's true for a lot of insects. Our bees and other insects are in serious trouble. You all are intimately familiar with the problems that are facing honeybees. And part of that comes from the fact that they are highly social and they have a hierarchy in a communal nest. And so diseases tend to, to grow in there and mites and so forth. We see some of that in our native bees, but these things that affect our native bees also are affecting honeybees too. So you see things like parasites and disease. You know that well from honeybees. We see that in our native bees as well. Um, right now, this is still being researched and it's been going on for decades. Um, and scientists, if I'm understanding correctly from the scholarly articles that I've read and the studies that I've read, they're like, so insects are so diverse <laughs> and there are some parts of earth we're never gonna get into to even find the insects. But I can tell you <laughs> that many of them across the globe are in trouble. And they, they see that like one researcher called it death by a thousand cuts. They're not quite sure how these drivers of decline play together. And they're not really sure that you can say that one is the predominant for all insects or another. But all of these are combining to, to really put insects in a, in a colossally bad situation. Habitat loss, fragmentation, and degradation are huge drivers of that. And that's because if you think about it, our area, including Houston and, and around it, Greater Houston used to be coastal prairie. There are still little fragments of it, but almost none. And so we've gone in and we built subdivisions and you know, in Houston, we're not going away. We're here, humans are here. And we have fundamentally changed the landscape. We've changed what we plant. We've changed how we use the land. We pollute, we use herbicides and pesticides. And by the way, homeowners are the worst with pesticides, proportionally the worst. But we have taken what was a continuous chunk of prairie and we fragmented it and altered it. And that's very, very hard on them. And so what's happening now? You know that when researchers, when entomologists take off their white lab coats, come outside the lab and say, okay, we're just, in the we are just starting this process of researching this. We have a long way to go, uh, but we can see the writing on the wall and it's extremely bad. So we need to do something about it. So when they come out and start advocating and asking you, me and everyone around us to do something about it, you know it's dire. So again, there's that death by a thousand cuts. And this was in a paper that was published at the start of this year from the symposium at the last. Serious declines in insects, abundance, diversity and biomass worldwide. Again. Not, it's different for different orders and different families of insect in different places, but it is not good. And they're calling for action now and they're calling for it at all levels, y'all. International, national, state, city, and individual level. And just to give you one little glimpse into this, I'm gonna tell you something. It was a, 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 a survey that was done in June of 2019. So it's a couple years old now. 
a little over two years. Um, it was Manga Bay News, which reports on tropics. And it had a four part um, series that I highly recommend. It's linked, by the way, in the PDF handout that um, Joe sent y'all by email when he announced this. There were links to two documents. One of them is a handout that I made for this talk and it includes links to these things. So it's called The Great Insect Dying, The Tropics in Trouble and Some Hope. And so what they did was they interviewed 24 entomologists from six continents representing 12 countries and they asked them a single question. They said on a scale of zero to 10 with 10 being, oh my gosh, horrifying, very dire and zero being nothing to see move along. How would you rate the crisis in insect abundance? And these are entomologists. No one said below eight and some said 10. So it's not good and I can't sugarcoat it. So are you ready for some rejoice and be glad news? Because <laughs> I give this talk all the time and let me tell you after that Debbie Downer moment, I'm like, please for the love of all that's good and decent, tell me something that's good. So here it is right here, right now, right in our own gardens. We form a critical link in the chain that will save insects and thus the ecosystem. Right here, right now, right at home. And we all know how a chain works, right? A chain will not function if it doesn't have all of the critical links, it has to have all of them. So I'm not gonna pretend that all we need to do is change how we garden at home. No, we absolutely have to do what we can do, which is usually more indirect at the international, national, state, and city, county level. We don't get a hall pass on that. And, but we do it in the way, the indirect way that we think best and vive la différence for different opinions on how to do that. That's cool. But let's flip that. We're gonna flip that coin. What this means is that our link is critical. Our link, our link of what we do at home. Like, I don't know about you, but that is the most freaking empowering thing that anyone ever told me. And this was from Dr. Talamy's books. This changed my way of thinking because I don't know about you. I see all these bad numbers about insects and I just want to curl up in a ball and I don't know what to do. I feel helpless, but don't feel helpless. Feel empowered by changing how you do things at home you are fulfilling your duty, our civic duty, just like voting and, and charity work and all the stuff that we do to help save insects. And I don't know about you, but that and a cup of coffee, that gets me up in the morning, right? Okay, so again, rising tide lifts all boats. If we do these types of changes that I'll talk about in the next part of this presentation, we're gonna save all of those insects and we're gonna save our honeybees and our native bees. Are you with me, y'all? Awesome. You're rock stars, hashtag rock stars. So here's how we do it. We plant habitat gardens with native plants. Now these are pictures from my front garden last year. Um, again, about 60% of the front yard, you can see I have a lot of forbs or flowering plants. I'm heavy on those for pollinators because I love me some bees, but I also have a lot of native grasses because a lot of our butterfly and moth species have evolved in the prairie, which has a lot of grasses to lay their eggs on those. The more we plant with native plants, the more we are creating stepping stones in the words of some of these researchers that will help reconnect the fragmented habitat in our cities. That little teeny bee where we held up our pinky finger, that three millimeter bee cannot get from my house to Memorial Park, but by gum, she can get from my house to my next door neighbor's blanket flower. And then two houses down to their scarlet sage, right? You with me? So we are creating stepping stones or another way that researchers speak of it is biocorridors. And Dr. Doug Tallamy refers to it as homegrown national park. Isn't that amazing? I love that. Okay, so let's keep going. I think it's fair at the start to say, you know, to answer the question about what a native plant is. And, and I'm going to tell you that there's actually a debate on what the meaning of native plant is. I like Dr. Tallamy's way of defining it um, in bringing nature home. 
He talks about plants that have historical evolutionary relationships with a particular wildlife community. How am I doing on time? Ooh, I'm getting low. I'm going to keep going. I'm going to go. I'm going to go. Am I okay? Do I have this? Are, is this okay? Okay. It's my first time to give this talk. So what does he mean by historical evolutionary relationships? So there are three components to that. First, time. It's been, it's been here for a long time. Not dozens of years, not hundreds of years, but millennia enough time for things to evolve to use the plant. Second, it's the thing of place. It's been there for a long time. In other words, it's been in this location with similar um, features, similar water, sun, soil, and so forth. And finally, the idea of community. Native plant is never a thing in the abstract. There's no such thing. You have to think of it as having co-evolved with other plants and animals that have evolved and adapted to use each other in a web of life. That's why it matters. So let's talk about why native plants are superior. Very quickly, I wanna show you what ecoregion we live in. So we're in the Gulf Coast prairies and marshes ecoregion. You can see it here. Um, these have similar conditions If you can actually subdivide it further. So I try and look for plants that are right around our county in our area. So one of the reasons that it's important to have native plants, I was sort of intimating before, and that is more things can feed on them. So about 90% of our insects are what we call specialists. Remember we talked about bees being specialists, baby bees, right? Or larvae, but baby bees is cuter. Okay. So the same is true for um, most plant eating insects, about 90% at some stage in their metamorphosis, in their, in their life cycle are specialists. And so they can eat the leaf or pollen of only those plants in a particular family, genus, or species. Now, this doesn't mean that they can't eat plants from Asia or Africa or Europe or South America that happen to be in the same genus. They might luck out and be able to do that. And we see that with our black swallowtail, whose caterpillars feed on rue and dill and fennel and parsley, right? Those are European herbs. But there are native equivalents as well. And that's not true of every single uh, insects. Some of them really need our native plants. Um, so we want to have those uh, plants that they have co-evolved with. And in fact, in that 2018 study mentioned at the bottom, one of the conclusions they reached, they were looking at something a little broader, was that ecosystems dominated by non-native plants are characterized by reduced insect diversity, abundance, and biomass. And it goes to, it, it kind of makes sense, doesn't it? They haven't evolved with it, they might not be able to eat it as much. They're also hardier in our climate. So if you have a plant that's native to our prairie in the Gulf Coast, it's used to being nuked in the summer and drowned in the spring. And so you replace them fewer times and that saves you money. And if you choose drought tolerant ones, it will save you some money on watering. Now we have some water loving native plants, of course, but in my gardens, I've really focused on drought tolerant and I don't own a sprinkler. There are some plants, and I'll show you one or two that I never water and others that I hit with a hose and spot water occasionally. They also save and purify water and prevent erosion. So um, let's talk about carbon for a minute, right? So the deeper the root of the plant, generally the more water and carbon it can sequester underground, both water and carbon both of which are good for Houston. Um, some of our prairie plants have roots, and this is not just the grasses, some of the flowering plants, the forbs too, have roots that are 12 to 14 feet deep. They're deeper than an adult human is tall. And so we want those plants in our garden because they sequester more carbon and more water. And they also filter water really well. And in fact, I went to a workshop in June of 2018 by the Katy Prairie Conservancy and Houston Audubon Society. And I spoke on a different topic, but someone there said, you know, in an average rainstorm, our St. Augustine lawns can sequester about half an inch of water per hour. But a full on prairie, not necessarily my garden, can sequester inches. So I want that, and that's what I want. It's also okay if they get out. Now beekeepers, I want you to hear me really closely on this. This is a no judgment zone, but I'm just gonna give you my two cents here. Remember I told you that if, so if you have an aggressive native plant and it gets out, the system has evolved to keep it in check. There are checks and balances. Something will eat it, et cetera, et cetera. 
That is not always true of aggressive non-native plants. Now, some non-native plants, things can eat or they're not aggressive. But certain things like Chinese tallow are highly aggressive and they get out easily because birds eat the berries, they poop out the seeds. I can tell you that single-handedly Chinese tallow has destroyed some of the fragments of prairie we have left. It is bad. It blooms crazy early and that's why it's so coveted for that pollen, right? So I'm gonna show you some native substitutes for it so that you don't have to have this. The thing about Chinese tallow is look at that root on the right, that deep tap root helps it outcompete our natives, makes it hard to eradicate and it shades out everything and is prolific. So just make sure that whatever you plant that's not native is not invasive. And there are um, several organizations that give information on that. So these are the books I was uh, mentioning before, Dr. Doug Tallamy's. If I had to recommend only one, it would be the one on the right. That's because that one came out in 2020. It's, a, it's sort of a sequel to the original one that came out more than 10 years ago. They don't tell you how to garden for wildlife, they tell you why to do it. Phenomenal, and he, he's an entomologist who doesn't write like an entomologist, you'll love it. Okay. In the last few minutes, I wanna introduce you to some flowering plants, some trees and some shrubs that you will love. Um, be, be ready to take screenshots of these because I wanna get through them in about eight minutes. I have chosen these. Um, most of them are early blooming, February, March, April, because I know you need that for your honeybees, right? I'm hearing you on that. I have also chosen them because all are native to our ecoregion. So when you see a date that's highlighted, that's the first bloom time, the earliest. So first we're gonna talk about some of those prairie flowers. If I could recommend one flower, one native prairie, it would be Indian blanket or firewheel or blanket flower, Gallardia pulchella. This is the best plant hands down. You can see from the highlighted date when it first starts blooming, late February, y'all, so it is early. It is actually an annual, but in the south where it's warm, this sucker can bloom all the way to the fall. It's crazy. It is hands down the favorite pollinator plant for the spring and the first part of the summer. And by the way, every plant that I'm showing you that I have in my gardens, I don't have all the trees and bushes, but everyone I've seen honey, I've actually documented honeybees on them, even if you don't see the photo. So it's good for all bees. I never water this plant. Let me say it again. I never water this plant. Do you know what? I never water this plant. It likes garbage soil and it likes to be nuked. The only way to kill it is too much TLC and it's moderately deer resistant. Landsleaf coreopsis, huge favorite of all bees and all kinds of pollinators. And by the way, the blanket flower is also loved by all pollinators. So this thing's awesome. This one can take full sun all the way down to part shade, but the sunnier, the more flowers it has. This sucker is blooming in March. Now it doesn't bloom too long. It blooms through early summer and when it gets too hot, it kind of goes dormant, but it stays green above ground, even though it kind of gets small. Um, and it readily reseeds, just like the blanket flower does, just like the fire wheel. It is not deer resistant. So I would not put this in your yard if you're on acreage or in a subdivision where there are deer but it, uh, it's, it's really good. And I don't water mine really, maybe once a summer or twice and it's in full sun. So this needs to be in your life. <laughs> Prostrate wine cup. I don't have a picture of a honeybee on these, but I have seen them foraging on it. They like it. So this is in the mallow family. Um, so this one, you've got to have full sun and like the others, you've got to have well-drained soil. It cannot have wet feet, doesn't want it. This blooms in early March, so slightly later than the others that I showed you. But it goes through early summer, again, not long lived. Um, it has a tap root. And so it will go down to very sparse leaves in the summer and fall, but then in the spring, it'll poof up again from that uh, tap root. It's minimally deer resistant, which is also nice. And look how freaking gorgeous that is. Is that not beautiful? It's a great ground cover. I use this as, um, I like to call it green mulch. Scarlet sage. So this plant blooms, I'll show you in a minute. I want you to take a look at what these, these gals are doing here, these folks are doing. So what they are doing, they're too big, including the honeybee in the upper left. They can't get inside that tubular flower. 
Now our teeny little bees can, and our hummingbirds and our butterflies and moths love it. They can get their proboscis in. So what they're doing is what we call nectar robbing. They're puncturing a hole and sucking out the nectar without pollinating. So our honeybees even do that. But also look at this gal. She's foraging pollen on the anthers that stick out. And I've seen hoverflies do the same. So this plant is great, um, very aggressive, just like the um, fire wheel I showed you. This one's highly aggressive. Uh, once you have it, like all salvias, it's a seed flinger, you always have it. But this stuff is great. It can take full sun to part shade. It doesn't need a lot of watering, but during the drought in full sun, I'll have to hit it about three times a week with the hose. Um, it starts blooming in February, so it blooms early and mine blooms all the way until the first freeze. Um, it is a perennial, it will come back from the root, but it comes back from seed and it's in the mint family with the square sun, so it's deer resistant. This one I just love. Um, this is called yellow wild indigo, Baptisia spiricarpa. We have several Baptisia locally, but this one I particularly like. I don't have a picture of a honeybee, but I've seen them foraging on it. It wants full sun. I hardly ever water mine. It starts blooming in March and it'll bloom through part of the summer. Um, certain butterflies and moths can use the leaves as a host plant. So there I'm, the rising tide is lifting all boats, right? And it has these cool seed pods that are like the size of the big marble when you're playing marbles. And it's also deer resistant, so it's super pretty. The thing about it is it's in the lagoon family. And so if you order seeds, you'll also wanna order um, a rhizobia. It's an inoculum. It's like a little something you put in the soil with it or just get some seedlings. And then when the seeds drop, the soil will already be inoculated. And this one is a summer bloomer. Oh my gosh, the bees and pollinating wasps love this. This is called spotted bee balm, Monarda punctata. I know it's late, a later bloomer, but oh my gosh, this has to be in your life. So we have several bee balms locally, among them um, lemon bee balm. We just have a bee balm or, you know, Monarda, uh, Monarda, blah, blah, blah. I forget the name of it. Hold on, I got it here. See, I get excited and I don't pay attention to my notes, y'all. Hold on. Ah. We have wild bergamot or bee balm, Monarda fistulosa, and lemon bee balm, Monarda citriodora. But I like this one. It blooms longer than the others. Um, hugely popular with uh, bees and wasps. Um, the thing is, uh, be careful with it because it will take over the world, but it is highly deer resistant. And if you don't like it, you just pull it out. Honorable mention, the wildflowers in your yard. These pop up native or not native, and sometimes they are the only food source in February for our critters. So here's how you make it look intentional. Line it with bricks. Your neighbors think it's intentional. Do not neglect those flowers, y'all. Okay, couple of minutes, let's talk trees. Am I going too fast? Can you stick with me? Okay. These are particularly important because I want to replace that darn Chinese tallow and Bradford pears. If we have Bradford pears in our yard, they need to go away. They are invasive. Thanks, Julie, for your help on this. So I have this in my gardens and I highly recommend it. Mexican plum, Prunus mexicana. Hugely favored by all critters, but especially I found beetles and bees. It can take sun to part shade. I have mine in full sun. Um, it can get about 25 feet tall at tops. Mine's probably about 20 right now, a few years old. I don't really water mine. I've trained my plants not to need a lot, um, but whatever you do, make sure it has well-drained soil. Again, as you've seen on many of these slides, those leaves are host plants for the caterpillars of various butterfly and moth species, rising tide. And the fruits are about this big. They're a little bitter. You don't get a lot of flesh off them, but humans can eat them. Don't ripen until the fall. But I like to leave them for the critters. You know, the birds and squirrels eat them. So this is a fantastic pollen and nectar source. 
Eastern redbud. So I do not have this in my yard, but these photos were taken where I teach, go Cougs, UH Law Center. Woo! And you can see honeybees and other bees are particularly fond of red buds. These bloom in starting in March. So again, another early forage for your honeybees. And honeybees are one of the species that like them. These can take sun to part shade, again, moderate watering. This one likes a little bit of a richer, moister soil, but doesn't want wet feet. And this one can get a little taller, sometimes 30 feet, but usually not. Like the uh, Mexican plum, it's deciduous. It will drop its leaves over winter. But also like the Mexican plum, caterpillars can feed on the leaves. I do not have this plant. Um, this is one that Julie recommended. So this is called cherry laurel or Prunus caroliniana. So this st sucker starts blooming in February with those little white flowers. Um, it's really good shelter for wildlife. It's actually in the rose family. It has very thick um, uh, uh, stems and, and, uh, and leaves and so forth. And so it's really good shelter for them. The seeds, leaves, and stems are highly toxic. I probably wouldn't put it in a yard where there's gonna be dogs or you know, little kids or something, but um, it appears to be deer resistance, uh, but it does have berries in the fall for wildlife. And then it has those great early forage flowers for all kinds of critters. The next is Yopon holly, uh, Ilex vomitoria. So this makes actually a good hedge or windscreen. Um, the leaves actually contain caffeine and were used by indigenous people for a tea. It's interesting. This one can take sun to part shade. Um, it's evergreen. That's one reason people like it. And those fruits here that are green turn red in the fall and winter. And even though um, humans don't eat them, <laughs> they're good for wildlife and they're just darn pretty and it provides good nest cover. Uh, this one I didn't know of before. It's called a two-winged silver bell. Gorgeous flowers starting in April, a bit later. Um, so this one is deciduous. It will lose its leaves, but it has really, really pretty spring white dangling flowers. Fruit for wildlife, deer resistant, pollen nectar source. It's a great tree. And finally, the white fringe tree. Um, Cyananthus virginicus. So this one's actually fairly small, 15 to 20 feet. It blooms in April. Um, it'll lose its leaves over winter, but it's a really good pollen and nectar source in the spring for our bees. You can see some of the information about it here. And finally, shrubs. Do I have time? Do I need to stop, Joe? I'll keep going. Keep going. You're good. I'm going. And I'm sorry I've gone so fast through the others. I know we're a little short on time. I wasn't quite sure how long, but what I can do is I can give Joe a list of all these plants with a link to the Lady Bird Johnson. But please keep taking those screenshots of this, okay? Yeah. And <laughs> I'll do that. Lauren, we're recording this so they can go back and watch it oh, again. Perfect. Perfect. And they can pause it and read in detail that slide. Fantastic. Yeah. All right, so this one I call the workhorse of the garden. I freaking love Texas lantana. It used to be called lantana orita, orita, but now it's urticoides. So as you can see, honeybees and other bees, and actually I see a lot of moths and butterflies on it. So this is great. Like the fire wheel, the Indian blanket, it wants full sun, well-drained soil, and I never water this stuff. It blooms starting in late February all the way until sometimes the first freeze. And that's why I call it the workhorse of the garden. Um, the birds eat the berries, but they're toxic to almost everyone else, including us. And um, for some people, not me, but for some, the leaves can have an oil that irritates the skin. So if it irritates your skin, just wear gloves and sleeves. Highly deer resistant. This one I have in my gardens. I love this. Southern arrowroot. Viburnum dentata. The viburnums are just a really good choice, actually. Um, I'll show you some details on it. So uh, this is actually the most versatile in where you can plant it and the conditions it can take. 
It's supposed to take moderate watering, but I hardly water mine. Again, it's acclimated to kind of being thirsty. Uh, mine's in full sun too, but it can go down to part shade. I suspect it blooms more in sun. So this blooms in May, a bit later, but um, it's really great. I would say that the other viburnum species that are native to our area, that um, some bloom in spring and the other in summer are these. Rusty black haw, B-L-A-C-K-H-A-W viburnum. So viburnum uh, refigulum, it blooms in the spring. And then possum haw viburnum, viburnum nudum, which blooms in the summer. But again, you can see it checks all the boxes, including berries or fruits for birds in the fall. And finally, buttonbush. So I don't own this. I don't have quite moist enough soil. It's very, very dry in my yard. But this needs to be in your life if you have the right conditions. All pollinators adore this. And look at those really cool flowers. This likes shadier spots and moister soil. Okay, that's why I don't have it in my garden. It doesn't get tall, but oh my gosh, again, summer bloomer, but oh my gosh, it'll bloom all summer through fall. And it checks all those boxes, including seeds for birds. And that my friends is that seven minutes late. Thank you for sticking with me. Thank this you so much, Laura. This has been great. Um, I'm taking notes and I'm sure I'll go find these immediately especially those that are deer resistant. We have some deer um, here at my location. Uh, not so bad in the spring and summer, but I hear in the winter they come around and pretty much take everything that isn't, you know, nailed down that they don't like. So well, and the thing about when it says deer resistant for trees, what we don't have deer in my neighborhood, of course, but what I was learning was that um, it doesn't mean that they won't eat it. It just means that it's resilient. Does that make sense? I'm now, back. some of them they won't eat, right? Yeah. Like, but um, it, it just means they bounce back a little better. <laughs> that it may be what uh, completely decimated. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Good deal. So uh, what questions may I answer y'all? Yeah, what questions do you guys have? Uh, the first question is, what is the substitute for Chinese tallow? Okay, so tallow blooms in what? February, March? Mm -hmm. Okay. So I would definitely recommend um, for trees, I would recommend that Mexican plum mm. and the, um, and the uh, Eastern red bud. Yeah. Those two that I mentioned, they bloom in February to March. They start blooming in February or March. Um, in particular, the Mexican plum, it blooms a little, I think it blooms a little earlier than the red bud. Mm -hmm. um, and there are others too, I'm just not as familiar with them. And I think that one of the others I showed also starts blooming in February too, right? But I would, I would also say if you're looking for things beyond, um, beyond trees to substitute for tallow, then pretty much any of those first flowering plants that I mentioned, so the um, fire wheel or Indian blanket, right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, what were some of the others I mentioned? Uh, Lance leaf coreopsis, that blooms early too, right? Um, and then Texas lantana. So mm -hmm. I, would, I would be more concerned looking at like, when does it first start blooming? Mm -hmm. That would probably be the thing that would guide me to substitute. But for tallow, I would substitute, if you're looking for a tree, I would definitely substitute Mexican plum, Eastern red bud, and maybe some of those others. Mm -hmm. Wonderful, thank you. Tallow gets bigger, but, but it's just, it's really a horrible, it, it's, it's so crushing to the environment. Mm -hmm. it's, it's hugely problematic. That, that if we can have a substitute that doesn't, isn't crushing, then why not do that? And why not? Uh, George asks, if you could only have two to three plants for a small area like a balcony, what would you recommend? Ah, great question. So let me ask you, George, would it be a sunny balcony or a semi-shaded balcony? Uh, sunny, yep, sunny shaded, sunny. but mostly okay. sunny. Okay, so... Um, so first off, that prostrate wine cup is a really nice one because you can actually do it in um, containers and it drapes over the edge and spills over. It's so darn pretty. So it's a ground cover, but it can drape. So you can do it from hanging baskets or from pots. Um, I would also say the Lanceleaf Coreopsis would do pretty well. It would take a larger pot for that. So I would definitely do that. Um, the salvia coccinea, the scarlet sage would do well too, though it gets a little bit tall and bushy 
But the good thing about that is you can always clip it back. Let me see. Um, I would probably stick with those flowering plants rather than shrubs. Um, let me think if there are others I would, oh, there are so many plants, to be honest. There's so many flowering plants. Um, those I think are the, you know what? I tell you what, I'm gonna go and figure out some things that would work well on a balcony beyond the ones that I recommended tonight. Um, does it matter, George, that they be, um, that they be blooming early? No, I, I'm new to all this. So, you know, whatever information you have would be fantastic. You just want something pretty. Yep. Yeah, okay. So, um, uh, Joe, if you will send me an email that reminds me to give a list of all the plants I mentioned tonight and then give some that would be good for containers. And then someone says, what do you recommend that will bloom in full shade? I'm yeah. happy to give that to you. And the one that blooms really well in full shade is Drummond's Turk's Cap. Yeah. Drum and Turk's cap. Um, I don't even ask me for the Latin binomial and the variety. Um, it gets pretty tall, but that one can take full on shade mm -hmm. and do just fine. Is that the red, also, the red version or? Okay. Yeah. 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 So the Drum and Turk's cap is red. It's that particular native variety, but um, they do a lot of hybrids and cultivars of that. And so I would just try and find the straight native if possible. So mm -hmm. that one does really well in full shade. Additionally, um, you know, okay, I'll tell you what, this is how we do it. Uh, let's see, Kareem. Okay. So, uh, on the handout that was linked in the email for this talk, the one that I did for this talk has a first section that talks about native plants mm -hmm. and it has plant finders, two sections of that. The first one is, I don't know what plants to plant, what finding tools exist on the web. And there's, there's a list there that will help uh, find that. Then there's one that's, okay, I've gone to a nursery and I found a plant, is it native? Give me a map that tells me it's native. And so that's there. A fantastic resource for shade loving plants, there are two of them. The Native Plant Society of Texas Houston chapter on its website has a native plant PDF list and it organizes it by shade, sun, uh, vine, tree, shrub, right? Uh, pollinator plants. So that's a fantastic one and it's linked there. Additionally, on the website of the Katy Prairie Conservancy and some other organizations, it's linked on my handout. They have two, um, they have two programs. One's the Nine Natives for Sun and the other is Nine Natives for Shade. And so they have not just flowering plants, but grasses, and they'll, they have specifically picked those that are native to our eco region that, that Houston lies in that like shade. And all of those are linked on that handout. Nice. Lots of great resources. Thank you oh, so great. much Thank you, for putting those together. I mean, honestly, I think all of us little plant nerds are gonna be uh, all over those for the next week. All right, members, any other questions for Lauren? All right, well, with that, please give Lauren a big round of applause. Give her your virtual hands. <laughs> and yay to you for listening about bees. As my husband says, honey, no one wants to hear that much about bees, dear. <laughs> yes, they do. <laughs> <laughs> but y'all do. Yes, we do. <laughs> Thank you so much. It's so nice to have you. And, um, and everybody, I want to highly recommend Facebook, find uh, St. Julian's um, uh, wildlife habitat. She posts some amazing pictures throughout the year. So thank you, Lauren, for all you're doing. Really appreciate it. Bye, y'all. Thank you so much. All right. all right, Joe, I'm going to hand it over to you for our virtual door prizes. Okay, our virtual door prize this month is we're going to do, uh, we've got those HBA t-shirts. And so the three winners will just need to send us their shirt size and which kind of shirt they want and their address. We'll order the shirt for them and have them shipped right to their house. So everybody stay on for a second here. I got the three winners. I did a random number generator selection while Lauren was talking. And our three winners are Christy Coles, uh, Perry Harrell, and Richard Johnson. Wonderful. 
big, uh, big class for you guys too. That'll be great. Those are some great shirts, by the way. <laughs> All right. Well, um, anything else that you need, Joe? Should they, do they, did you say they email the club or? Email, uh, they can email me um, or email the club. Then we'll get the, the email will get to me. Actually, I'll reach out to them and send them an email because I've got the email from the Zoom call. And, uh, and uh, then we can go from there, yeah. Wonderful. Great. Well, thank you all for joining today. Our next meeting will be September 21st, again, a Tuesday. We'll just see how it goes between now and then. We may be in person. We may be virtual. We'll just roll the dice as we get closer. So have a great evening and see you guys again next month. Thank you all. All right. Thanks, Sandy. Bye.